Anyways, it's time. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Stefan Greber. I work for myself these days. I'm not at Canonical anymore. Uh, but I am presenting work that uh, Alex uh, has been working on for a bit, and he's, it does work at Canonical. So uh, it's the two of us. Alex is unfortunately stuck in Germany because of visa problems with the US. Um, so I've got the honor to actually go and give the actual talk. Um, all right. So what are we trying to do? Some bit of background around this. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with how the user namespace works, and I don't know many of those that might be in the room, uh, which I'll see, um, the user namespace, <coughs> sorry, the user namespace maps a, a UID and GID or a set of UID and GID um, between the namespace and its parent. So in most cases, the parent is the host system, but it could also be another namespace and you can nest those things. Um, most container runtimes that use the user namespace will map uh, 65K UID and GID uh, so that uh, mostly trying to get POSIX compatibility, making sure that nobody no group is mapped properly. Um, and yeah, just trying to make things mostly work. Uh, that's been done for, for a while. Now, a common pattern uh, in, in some of those uh, container managers is to map non-overlapping, so effectively create non-overlapping maps. That means every single container on your system gets a minimum of 65K UID and or more than 65 containers, which as it turns out these days, you often do. Um, there's a bunch of software, especially around like sandboxing and the like, which likes to create um, temporary users. And those are often uh, using pretty high UIDs and GIDs for those, those users. Uh, so there's a bit of a problem. Um, on top of that, we have um, also like things like remote uh, authentication. So if you're using, whether it's Active Directory, some LDAP system or whatever. Um, those systems will um, also use higher UIDs and you end up having to often allocate something in the neighborhood of uh, anywhere from like one to 10 million UIDs and GIDs per container. And if you want that to be non-overlapping, you're gonna run out of your entire set pretty darn quickly. Um, do you actually have, oh, we've got one of the TVs. Not quite back, no, it's not. The, okay, this one is back, okay, cool. Um, all right. So that's a bit of a problem we have there. Um, oh, we lost audio on the chat too. Okay, well, uh, I was mostly reading the slides, so it should be fine. Um, then the other issue with the non-overlapping thing is kind of mediation. So there is the concept of sub-UID and sub-GID files on, on most Linux uh, systems using recent versions of Shadow. Uh, this does let you... Um, kind of decide what user can use what range. And assuming each container manager uh, effectively has its own user it looks at, it's possible to make sure that they don't like go and stamp on each other. It's not foolproof, and we've noticed that there's been very little adoption of actually, actually using those mechanisms to, to mediate on any given system, uh, which often results in multiple container managers or different tools effectively using the same UIDs and GIDs and causing some conflicts, which you know, causes a whole bunch of fun. Um, the other issue, uh, even outside of that, is um, depending on what you're mapping, if you just want to go kind of nuclear option and map most of your UIDs and GIDs across the entire system, uh, then you're gonna have the problem of a container potentially using a UID of a legitimate user on your host system, uh, which is not something we'd generally recommend. Um, there were a bunch of actual issues with that in the past, where if you were sharing the same UID and GID map in multiple containers, one container could make use of, say, resource limits that are tied to UIDs, and those would go and propagate across multiple containers, causing a whole lot of fun. Um, I believe most of those have been tracked down and fixed by now, uh, in that they are somewhat tied to the user namespace um, that they belong to and don't cross quite as widely, but it's still not something I would generally recommend people doing. Now, during previous editions of Plumbers, um, we, we obviously went through that, that problem and offered supernatural ideas of how to deal with this stuff. Um, another nice, uh, nice improvement we've had since probably the last time I talked about this was the addition of ID mapped mounts by this guy's looking at his phone in front there. Uh, 
So with ID mapped mounts, we effectively allow decoupling uh, the issue of what do you write stuff ha as on the file system as opposed to what is used uh, in kernel more like, F like as an, an ephemeral ID effectively. Um, this decoupling is really, really convenient because it lets us do a lot of very interesting things now um, where you can totally have users that just don't have any mapping to the file system and it's perfectly fine. Um, or if you just need a subset of those users to be mapped to some specific IDs outside of it, you can totally do that too. Um, so the VFS ID mapped mounts have really helped a lot with that and the fact that they are supported by most file systems these days is definitely unblocking a lot of kind of the ideas and stuff in, around uh, the work we're doing here. All right, so uh, what, what are we actually trying to do to, to make all of this magic work? Well, the general idea is uh, what about making UID and GID is 64-bit? Uh, but we're going to need to hide that from user space because, well, there's you know, existing APIs and stuff and you don't want to cause a whole, whole mess there. So that's the rough idea. Um, the way uh, we've actually done it is um, so in kernel, UIDs and GIDs become 64-bit. 32-bit uh, of that is your normal UID, and 32-bit of that is effectively a random uh, identifier that refers to a namespace. And that allows effectively anyone to create a new user namespace and be like, well, you know what? Any UID and GID in this thing um, that is not mapped, that I don't own at host, just map it to one of those things. And that allows and for that resources in kernel to, to be owned by a different UID and GID. Um, and they just keep on going. Like you can have processes on by that, and it works just fine. Um, where it gets fun is when you need to actually have anything persist again, because you need to go through the, the file system. But that's where the ID map mounts are magical. And we can just say that like, well, within this namespace, this range of UIDs and GIDs are mapped to this channel to, to be owned by a different UID and GID. Um, and they just keep on going. Like you can have processes on by that, and it works just fine. Um, where it gets fun is when you need to actually have anything persist again, because you need to go through the, the file system. But that's where the ID map mounts are magical. And we can just say that while well, within this namespace, this range of UIDs and GIDs are mapped to this range of UIDs and GIDs on the host, and go and send your writes through it. Um, so that's made things quite, quite simple, quite nice. Um, with this concept, it allows for effectively any user on any system to get an entire range of valid UIDs and GIDs uh, inside of a user namespace that they create just as themselves. No set UID thing, no like, no help from a privileged process. Um, and so we'll show very shortly in a, in a demo. And we'll get to the actual kind of set of changes and stuff. There's going to be like a QR code linking to the patches, but uh, as as much as I was, I was extremely scared by that proposal originally of like, oh, we're going to have to change just about everything in the kernel. As it turns out, we didn't, uh, which was a very good surprise. So um, that's a bit of the you know, slightly more nitty gritty of how this stuff was done. Uh, so as mentioned, the general idea is KUID uh, K and KGID type have been changed from 32 bit to 64 bit, um, where half of that is used as a user namespace identifier. The, um, there are a few extra changes that were made to allow for controlling that, which is currently a simple text file um, that you can write to, and that just turns the thing on uh, for the given namespace you created. Uh, it's very similar to the to, to the set groups API, um, and there were just a few a few of the normal KUID KGID helpers that needed some tweaking around that, uh, and similar changes were needed on the VFS ID map side to also handle that properly. So that's kind of the rough idea of how that stuff was has been done. Um, I'm just going to go through a quick demo to show what things look like today. So let me just make sure my terminal is all set up here. It is. And I should be able to do screen share, allow, full display, share, and yay. All right. Uh, let me just zoom the hell out of this stuff. There we go. Hopefully, that should be fine. OK, uh, so I'm going to start with your box standard uh, user namespace and a very easy way to create one. Uh, so fork, remap um, UID 0 and GID 0 inside of that namespace to the unprivileged user outside of it. And then user namespace enabled, mount namespace, network namespace, build namespace, and uh, please don't mess with my mount propagation. Effectively, that's what all those flags do. OK, you do that, and you get your usual, hey, I'm root, but not. Um, so you're root. 
but if you go look at the actual map, you can see there's a single UID and GID here. It's root. It's mapped to UID GID 1000 outside of it. All right, cool. Um, I did write the simplest piece of C that I'm capable of writing pretty much, um, which is called set ID. It's effectively SU minus all of the PAM stuff. Uh, so all it does is it changes your GID, your GID first, UID second, and then exec bash. Um, that lets me do something like this, where I can do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And it tells me that I should go away because I'm inside of a user namespace that only has a single UID and GID mapped. And one, two, three, four is definitely not valid in here, so go away. Um, that works as expected. But now we can do this. So just echo yes in isolated user namespace. It doesn't change the map. Uh, so if we go look at this stuff, nothing has changed. It just has changed the behavior for anything outside of the map. So now if I go and do this stuff again, hey, correct. And sure enough, um, my UID and GID, everything is set properly. Now, there's an obvious issue with this. Um, and like if I here has my fake root mapped to my actual and previous user, I can totally create a file. It works fine, no problem there. Uh, if I try and do the same thing from here, well, this is a lot more fun because there's nothing, there's no file system map or anything in place, so it's going to just fail. And that might actually be fine for many cases. Um, like, well, I'm not going to do any demo of the VFS stuff because there's actually some issues in that test kernel. Um, but um, like, you could totally mount a tempfs from inside of that user namespace, and then that user would be able to be represented on that and writes through just fine. Same thing if you do a fuse mount at that stage, like a fuse mount that originates from within the namespace would be perfectly valid uh, for, for that random user. There's no problem there. The only issue is when you interact with outside of the user namespace. And for that, well, we've got Christian to thank for the VFS ID map stuff because that's how you do that. Um, so now if we want to have some fun, um, we've got that process, so that bash process running here. Now let's look at what that looks like from outside of it. So we can see bash is running here. As far as what shows, both of them show running as Ubuntu, so UID 1000. The reason for that is um, what we've done is when looking at the UID from at anything outside of the namespace, we, will, we can't represent this thing. It's just not possible. So what we do is we pick the uh, owner credential from the user namespace, so whoever created the user namespace effectively, and that becomes the owner for anything in the process tree as far as what shows in traditional fields. Now, there is some way to actually go and get more details. Uh, so if we go look at uh, proc, this file, and status, and we go through this entire mess, we can see, so UID and GID are your standard ones, but there's also isolated UID, isolated GID, which shows you the value inside of that um, isolated user namespace. So if anyone cares, they can figure it out. Um, there are a lot more edge cases around that for like, other ways that UIDs and GIDs are being sent through right now, which will be translated the same way, but we're also having some way to get the actual thing um, would be interesting. So that's roughly how that stuff works. Um, as mentioned for, I can't really do the storage demo right now. It's some issue with that test kernel, um, but we did make it work, just not in this build. Um, and it, it uses VFS ID map, or you can just do a, a mount directly inside of that user namespace, and that works as one would expect. Um, so if I go and, and share my screen, we're back to slides. There we go. So there is a uh, QR code for anyone who cares to go look at the patches. If you scan that, you're going to see the 11 or so patches that were needed for this work. Um, it's also listed, um, I think, in the slides themselves. There's like a bunch of links at the end that will have that. So what's next, other than fixing this kernel build so that the VFS stuff functions? Well. Um, the main issue we currently have is that it requires root to be a, a real UID. Um, that's kind of fine, but that's also the one user I really don't want to give a real UID to. Um, so we're, we're looking at, uh, at fixing that particular one so that you don't need to. You could totally create a user namespace with no map set whatsoever, then set uh, this flag to yes, and then switch to whatever user you want on there, and that should be working just fine. And again, if you want anything to persist, then you're going to need the VFS ID map uh, to sort that one out. The 
there's some uh, more integration bits with the VFS ID map that's going to be needed. Um, I know that Christian is quite keen on kicking out any reference to the user namespace from a bunch of the ID map stuff in the kernel, which is going to make um, this particular patch set a bit longer because there's not going to be any obvious way to get to the user namespace and get the stuff we need. Um, but I mean, nothing that can't be worked out. And uh, mentioning kind of some of the, the other corner cases and, and you know areas where um, where things are being sent through. SCM creds one of was one of those that came to, to mind where you do get UID and GID that way. Um, in this case, you would get the UID and GID of the namespace owner, but um, it would be nice to have additional fields in there as well so that you can tell, okay, well, yeah, that's the own, clearly this is coming from a user namespace. That's the owner as far as what's represented on the host, but inside is actually this user. Because we've seen occasionally like demons and the like on um, on the host wanting to know whether it came from a root user inside of a namespace. Um, it's always a bit risky because like this is possible to do. You can just, like, easily get that information. You should just not assume that this is any kind of proof that this user is privileged in any way because it's not. Um, but that's that's still um, something there. Uh, the other thing uh, that that we're looking at still is kind of handling of all of the nested stuff. Um, so obviously wanting to get that in, like it, it should be fine. Like you should be able to be inside of a user namespace and just do this. And that's not a problem because we don't strictly need those things to be hierarchical in any ways in the kernel. It's just like a random random ID uh, that's used for this. Uh, and that's that's kind of mostly the idea. Uh, I, I'll actually go and uh, click, let me see if I can actually click on the darn link, that would be nice. Um, I have to go through the patches real quick. Let me just open that up here and I can, I can screen, be... screen share that button, yeah. Is it okay if I... Yeah. It, it, sh wouldn't it be better if you disallowed uh, writing ID mappings completely to isolated username space because I thought it was also the, uh, the original idea? Yeah, I think I'd be actually quite fine with that. Um, if, like, there's so the reality is, is that once you do have a VFS ID mapped working, anyways, you don't really need to map anything to a like user of actual value. Uh, so that's that would actually avoid potential issues. Um, Not just that, I think it would clean up the user space if they saw, okay, there is no ID map mm -hmm. written, and uh, yeah. yeah, it just I think it makes the implementation cleaner and just keep the ID mapping part completely mm -hmm. out of this. It's yeah. essentially a new type of user namespace mm -hmm. if you're being honest. Yeah, we're gonna have to think about like whether there are some kind of cases where like you might want to, you know, whether it's shipping an FD across or shipping something across between the host and the and a user namespace in that mode where you would actually need to have a UID that that can be resolved uh, for that. I definitely want to make sure that we don't need one uh, because like especially for root, that's that seems wrong. Um, and I would definitely like. I don't know that we necessarily need to block it, but it definitely should not be the default in any kind of examples or anything. It should be a, if you have a weird need where you actually do need the user to be mapped to something on the, the previous, le on the parent level, then you need to go and write a map, not a, always write a map unless you don't have enough things. Because what I don't want to see is container managers mapping the first 65K UIDs and GIDs, and then just using that for the overflow, so for anything past the initial 65K. Because that's going to be extremely confusing. Um, like it would work just fine, but it would be really, really confusing to see. I think. Um, this typo wants the mic behind you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Can you just talk through how the um, mount stuff stuff would work? How that mount mapping would work? Like if if I am mm -hmm. trying to write from somebody who isn't mapped, right. what happens? Oh yeah, I can show you that, but is it? It fails. I mean, I, well, think, I, I think I did it all right. It, fails, it does fail. You must have a solution that actually works. Right, so the, that? yeah. Right, so that's why you use the VFS ID mapped mounts where you, you effectively tell the kernel, like, hey, uh, this path there, I want it to be mounted kind of as a bind mount to this path, but now any write from UID 1234, in my case, needs to be mapped to either straight up UID 1234 on the host or be mapped to whatever you want. And so it, it, there is no like uh, anonymous namespace or isolated namespace like this for ID map mounts. 
Right, no, like because the demand need to be need to be mapped to a real resource. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the part where you do need something privileged to put that in place. Sure. Um, the cool thing is that in theory, in many cases, you might not like it's possible to create a unprivileged container manager that would use this and not need anything privileged whatsoever. Because so long as you you just use um, either you create a temp you unpack everything, and you pivot to it. Or you use a like fuse implementation of the OCI Larry stuff, you would also get a root file system out of it that you can pivot to. Um, and in those cases, you don't even need any ID map to anything because you're effectively just running everything ephemerally inside the the container. Um, you would just need something like an ID map if you needed to pass through like a slash data storage thing to actually read and write data through. Yeah, I guess what I'm wondering is like, can I get away with? not ever mapping anything with this. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, no, I'll always need to map the file system. Yeah, you would, yeah, un unless, I said like, unless unless it, unless it you can originate just it from like a, mount, a fuse mount in, from inside a user namespace or a tempfs from inside a user namespace, those would be perfectly fine. In theory, uh, network file systems that also support the user namespace would similarly just work. Um, I see, okay, thank you. Yeah, like my, thinking my user could see the file system, it was just seeing it as, overflow whatever so you could only see anything that had the other permission bit set um which can be good enough i mean like we've seen cases with like web browsers and other tools where it's quite valuable to be able to have like every one of your rendering threads or whatever renders different users so that they can't attack each other on yeah, that kind of stuff and that would make it really quite easy have you looked into um uh, possible interactions with lsm hooks I just remember this from the work that I mm. did for the ID map mount stuff, that the uh, LSM hooks were the part where all of the nastiness lies. Um, mm. I think I fixed most of that for, uh, for ID map mounts, but there's stuff like mm -hmm. uh, Tomoyo that looks at UIDs and GIDs and has like weird rules in user space mm -hmm. where you can restrict based on UIDs and GIDs and any stuff like that probably mm -hmm. would need some. Yeah, that's okay. going to be an or interesting one for that. sure. Uh, I don't know if uh, if Alex looked into that. He can comment in the chat since I think his microphone is not behaving right now. Um, but um, it's it's definitely interesting. And the question would be then, what is exposed to the LSM hook? Do we expose the same as user space, which is just the the owner of the of the namespace, or is it because they are in kernel, they actually do get to see the entirety of the the thing, and they can distinguish like, oh, actually this is root, but like inside of that namespace. Uh, so I think it's going to be interesting to look into that i don't know how that works today uh given the kind of work i just don't know sure. which of the two code paths they are they're getting whether they're getting the full 64-bit um kuid kgid or if they are getting the subsets that's effectively filtered to just be what's exposed to user space um, hopefully alex knows and yeah, can have more answer. fun because now they just saw a talk in mm -hmm. the ebpf session about the uh, lsm hooks from from bpf where they implement for example uh, safe set DID or like mm -hmm. UID and GID transition rules in yeah. PPF programs, and they look at KUIDs uh, mm -hmm. directly. So you yeah, so in those cases, they would see the 64-bit mm -hmm. thing, which would, I mean, that's kind of always the thing with EBPF, right? Like you effectively build it using oh, kernel internals. It's not your issue. Then. Right. Yeah, I mean, it is built with kernel internals. So in this case, yeah, it means that your EBPF program will have to deal with not seeing 32-bit anymore, but seeing 64-bit, and either calling the, the helper we have to strip um, the String which strip whichever half you don't care about effectively, um, or just actually look at the whole thing. Um, yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting, and I think there's a bunch of other other interesting kind of edge cases around that. Yeah, yeah. Now that I think about it, like a, the safe set ID uh, LSM would be kind of interesting for how it interacts with. I don't know how mm -hmm. it interacts with user namespaces, but in this case, it would be interesting if you if it, you want to restrict uh, setting to UID one two three four how this would work with isolated user namespaces they need to be taught probably to work with this yeah and i see that uh alex is currently typing uh can, can hear the you, question but not me? sure if you can hear me no we can't hear you uh so that's oh. why like you you'd need to to type in the chat and we can read that uh, we're gonna have to figure out the the speaking part before okay. your your talk uh, so i was just gonna um yeah so that's the current patch sets effectively um which 
I don't think we've got a diff stat ready, but like I remember the diff stat being surprisingly small. Like I was really worried when we started doing that, that it was going to be the same as when the user namespace got introduced, where pretty much everything in the kernel had to be modified. Um, but thankfully, between the work that was done with like separating the ID mapped and all that stuff for the, for the VFS work, and um, just the fact that everything's using very, very much macros and functions kind of all over the place, uh, it was a much, much smaller patch set than, than was expected and was really, really good to see. If this will have a chance at, uh, at being merged, it needs to be really small because I, exactly. I don't think anyone is keen on No. Yeah, and was kind of, that's why we wanted to do this proof of concept to get an idea for like, okay, is this insane or not? And currently we're like on the, it doesn't look completely insane category. Um, obviously the, the next, the next steps are going to be, um, well, refining the patch that actually works properly. Uh, the fact that we saw a regression, uh, when testing things today, well, was a good indicator of we need tests. Uh, so that's going to be another, another thing that needs to be added. Uh, and then sending some RFCs on the, the containers and LKML list to, to get some more people to look at them, poke more holes in there, and also get a better idea of kind of what's the minimum set of things to be, um, to have this being included. Like we currently don't see something like SCM creds extensions as being needed in the initial pass. Like this is the kind of thing we can, that can be built on top and added later on. Um, so, and we can see Alex's camera, but, uh, oh, and it did, right. Um, seen that they have seen the um save that uid uh lsm thing and oh well, actually i think we just got some noise from your microphone alex maybe um so you mm -hmm. might want to try that again mm -hmm. oh there we go okay. yeah we can hear that okay. it's interesting because probably the turning on the video helps to get microphone working <laughs> uh okay hello everyone yeah i have uh listened to the questions and yeah i have definitely seen this set, set save you eat stuff and i have uh, make it just to work properly with the old uh, in the old approach when the uid is mapped uh, to properly handle this extension to 64 bit but for the completely isolated user id it just ignores them for now and also this uh, lsm as far as i remember it was a few months ago uh, it only works with the uids on the that mapped to the host so it does not handle anyhow the user ID transition inside the username space. So all the rules is relative to the host, but Oh, yeah. okay. It's not even names. It's not even current user namespace aware in any ways. It just always shows you the, the host's value K, KUI. Well, okay. As long as you can't really load safe set ID rules from containers, it should be fine because you then essentially just restrict what host UID you can save yeah. UID to that, which should be fine, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it should work because because we have all the UIDs map, mapped to the host, but it means that all the all rules that we write to, to this LSM uh, will be relative to the host UIDs, not the, to the container ones. If I not miss anything there, it is kind of interesting, Tad. That yeah, indeed, with the with eBPF being. Uh so widely used these days a bunch of those programs are gonna have a fun day uh when something like this lands because anything <laughs> that's loading an ebpf program that compares uids and gids would like since they're seeing the kernel side type not the user space side uh they're gonna see the, the other one but i mean that's what you get for using ebpf like that's yeah. the whole point of you've got access to those kernel internals so it's true there too the issue is we just had this discussion before, and it was a patch set a while ago where they wanted to set X adders from BPF uh, programs. And then you run into similar issues where you can set uh, POSIX ACLs or mm -hmm. FS caps that store UADs and GADs. Right. And if you don't have the right context from a BPF program, yeah. that, you know. And I think you wrote the code to translate those in next day, right? That was not exactly trivial to like pull the binary value of those things and like do all the rewrite and shifting and stuff it's it's a bit of a pain so even if they did know what namespace it is actually writing the right value to the x adder is not trivial all right well uh we're about to run out of time um thanks for, for all the great questions it was definitely very appreciated uh we're gonna as i said like we're gonna try and get uh, rfc patches out pretty soon the yeah the patch set is surprisingly nice and easy to follow so hopefully uh we can make some progress on that i would love to see some kind of first pass of this, you know, getting merged in the next year. So that'd be amazing. Um, 
if you've got any more questions around that, well, feel free to reach out to either uh, myself or Alex. And thanks a lot.